Oh, I hate this video. This is horrible. I like it. What's up, guys? Damien Keys here. Welcome back to the channel. So we are talking today about how music made me a millionaire. Oh, God, I feel sick already. I feel so uncomfortable talking about this type of thing. I don't know if it's a British thing or if it's just a self-awareness thing, but this is a very uncomfortable position to be in about to make a video on something that I just... I feel just very weird and, and, and dirty and grimy talking about it, but we're gonna get through it. We're gonna get through this together and then I'm gonna have a shower for a long period of time. So you might be asking why I have made such a disgustingly titled video. And hey, I apologize for the clickbaity title, but welcome to YouTube 2020. It seems like more and more I am getting asked the question, how much of your money comes from teaching versus how much of your money comes from playing and actually doing the thing? And I get it. There's a lot of scammers out there. There's a lot of people doing courses. There's a lot of people trying to teach stuff in the music industry. And it feels like a little bit of a kind of lose-lose because if I ignore this question time and time again it feels like I've got something to hide whereas if I tackle it head-on and I give a massive big flex then I come across as a complete bell end. So in this video I wanted to tackle it in a way where I can be honest and tell you how my monthly finances break down and one thing you might want to know is Teaching and educational stuff works out at around about 20% of my monthly income. So come with me on a journey and I will try my best not to make this too dirty as we break down my finances. So let's get dirty. I mean started. You might know me as a YouTuber that spends more time talking about music marketing than I do about the music itself. But first and foremost, I am and always have been a musician. So I think we need to go back to the beginning. I recently made a video on YouTube, which we'll just put around about here, about how I got signed and dropped by a major label when I was 18 years old. But that effectively is where the story started. Growing up in the mean streets of Swansea in South Wales, at that point, I knew I wanted to be a bass player. I knew I wanted to play for a living. So that's exactly what I did. I basically found a way to be able to play three or four times every single week. I'd play anywhere, anytime for anyone, which pretty much at that point meant I was playing social clubs, which if you don't know what social clubs are, they're pretty much clubs of old men. And because of that, we were playing some horrifically cheesy tracks, but it meant I got to play and I was getting paid. Probably not a lot, probably getting paid somewhere between 30 and 70 quid per gig. Now, if you're thinking, oh, way back in the day, that was a fortune. No, no, this was 20 years ago. 30 quid was 30 quid. It's pretty much the same as what it is now. We pay play for three hours, all of that for 30 quid. But I loved it. I got to play every single day. I got to make a tiniest amount of living, which would keep me going. And more importantly, I got to learn my trade. The thing is, whilst this was good for a while, I felt like in order to progress, I needed to leave Swansea in the search for something bigger, which is exactly what I did. I left to go nearer London where I signed up to a music course at a college called ACM, Academy of Contemporary Music, where they asked me to stay on as a bass teacher whilst I was still studying there at 19 years old. And it was amazing. I got to work with musicians and teach bass players every single day. I was in my element. But three to four years later, the college had grown from 44 students to 700 students. And it felt like I'd taken the world of pressure on. Myself and, and one of my best mates, my mentor, in fact, Bruce, decided we were going to leave and set up in competition, which is what we did. We set up a music college called BIM, the Brighton Institute of Modern Music, which is now the British Institute of Modern Music, which is now the largest set of music colleges all over the world. But at the time, it didn't start like that. It was myself and three other people who set up a very small college in order to be able to do that on a daily basis, to look after musicians, to work with musicians, to work on strategies. It was never to start it to make the money, which is why it started in my living room. So whilst BIM is now worth a hundred million pounds, oh, I hate this video, this is horrible. Back then when we started, I had no money. And in order to get that set up and live, I still had to play two or three times a week. I had shoes held together with gaffer tape, but it didn't matter because 
I got to still play and be a part of the music industry. Over the first three years of BIM, we had some amazing students. In fact, we had 23 top 40 hits in the first three years, which was such an amazing thing to see. Whilst I was at BIM, we also had a record label on the side and I spent a couple of years being a DJ on a radio show with my good friend Ace from the band Skunk and Nancy where we promoted up and coming talent. Then after close to 10 years, I felt like I was in a place where I'd become very disillusioned with what we had built compared to what I wanted to build and what I thought we would build. I felt like I was in meetings with everything from lawyers and accountants and board meetings instead of doing the one thing that I truly loved to do, which was sitting with musicians, having a cup of tea, talking about strategies. So it was time to go on my way. I sold my 25% shares in the company, which was amazing. I mean, it took nine months and it was horribly messy, but at the end of the day, it set me up for life. I didn't need to work again after that. But I wasn't gonna retire at 30 years old because just like you guys, I would class myself as musician first and foremost. It's time to get back into playing. Now, whilst I was on some decent money in that last couple of years of BIM, it was only at the end when I'd received a lump sum payment from selling my shares that I really noticed the difference. And I did what everyone else would do. I went down to the bank ATM, put my card in, typed my number in, and seven figure numbers showed up on my bank street. I wanted to, I wanted to tap the guy behind and go, <laughs> look at this, this is amazing. Um, what else was there to do? It was ridiculous. I mean, I've come from this, uh, this city in Swansea with no GCSEs and failing everything and then all of a sudden have this big amount of money in my bank. So money aside, because this is getting dirty and disgusting again, at that point, being 30 years old, I didn't want to retire. I wanted to play. I wanted to carry on building something. So I went back to what I knew. Playing bass, I would play anywhere and everywhere. Originals, covers, whatever style, if there was a gig, I was on that gig. So one of the things I did was put together a band with my mates where we could go and play a bunch of festivals and unis because they were such fun to play. Sex on Fire had just been released by Kings of Leon and that was a huge movement and we were doing a very similar thing. So we played to like 500 or 1,000 people at these festivals or unis and they were so much fun. And at which point we got approached by an agency who asked us if we wanted to carry on playing another bunch of gigs at things like weddings and corporate events. Now there is a huge stigma about musicians who play weddings, which I never understood because if I'm on stage and I have my bass in my hand, I'm a happy camper. If I'm getting paid for that, then I'm a very happy camper. And whilst there is a stigma attached to it, the last year that I was playing, we did 18 stadium gigs as a covers band because we were doing uh, contracts for Sky Sports. So we were playing to 30 or 40,000 people one night, and then we play a birthday party or a wedding in front of 50 people the next night. That is being a musician. It's the ups and downs. You play arenas, you play pubs, you play studio, but then you play a birthday party. That is what a long-term career of a musician usually is. Now, whilst we were playing quite a lot of gigs, this agency kept coming back and saying, we could get more gigs if we had more bands. And because of my contacts and my background in teaching, it was very clear and easy for me to make another band for that agency to put out. And two bands became three bands, became five bands, became 10 bands, we ended up with 30 bands. Those 30 bands, which still exist today, do over 1,500 gigs a year. And then about three years ago, I actually bought the agency itself for a million quid, which meant that that agency puts on over 5,000 events. So between the 5,000 events, the management company, which then puts the bands into 1,500 of them, which means I hire about 100 to 120 musicians a week to go and do these gigs. Now, is it the top end level stadiums? No, it's not. But what it does mean is there's another 100, 120 musicians who are out earning their crust from playing. And there's probably another 100 to 120 musicians who are on the sideline coming in to do depths who also are making money. So now I have a management company which manages bands for events as well as an agency which puts on events. And then on top of that, about three years ago, I started this YouTube channel, about three and a half years ago. The reason for that was I actually wanted to learn about social media. Having come from building 
building businesses and not wanting to be left behind, this was a chance for me to learn how things work. So I did what I always do. I took to doing music education so I could figure it out and making videos for musicians. And more musicians kept coming back and asking me more questions. The thing is, the music industry has changed drastically in the last couple of years. So answers that I was giving many years ago had now changed. So not only did I need to figure it out, but I needed to go and talk to loads of my mates who were still in bands, who were still in studios, and start figuring stuff out and putting it together. And then as this started to grow, I got offered a publishing deal from a, a book company asking me to write a book, which I think is absolutely ridiculous, insane. And I wrote my first book, and then a year later I wrote my second book, and that's sort of comes under the education side of things. Now, when it comes to the education side of what I do, I probably make about a thousand, fifteen hundred bucks a month from selling books. I probably make around about two to three thousand from my YouTube channel, but my YouTube channel has only been making money over the last nine months. It's had exponential growth. The first three years didn't really do much. I made hardly any money. Whereas now, because it does this, now I've got an audience and now I can make money from streaming. And I think in a year's time, I'll be able to make a lot more from that. But it shows how much work you have to put in because I reckon I've probably spent about a hundred grand on building my YouTube channel when it comes to videography, adverts, marketing, events, etc., in order to build it. So I've only actually made about 10% of, of what I've spent back on my channel. On top of that, I do get asked to do keynotes and speeches from time to time, which I get paid for. And we are about to fully launch DK Music Business Academy, which I want to be the world's best music business resource. I'm very, very excited about that. On top of that, I own a social media company, which is quite early days, and I own some properties from when I sold BIM. But more importantly, how does my monthly income break down as education versus the actual doing and playing itself? So around about 50% of income comes from the music related businesses, which include band management and the agency for events. Then on top of that, you've got another around 20%, which comes from the advertising agency, which is advertising and marketing side of what I do. Then 10% of my income comes from investments, which is mostly properties and rental. And then the big one, which is 20% of my income comes from anything educational wise, which covers YouTube, books, it also covers mentorship, as well as my Music Business Academy. So why am I telling you all of this and making this disgusting video, which is very clear that I feel very uncomfortable? Well, the reason is, is trust. I wanna be transparent, and on top of that, I don't want to be lumped in with everyone else who's doing music business courses that are costing far too much money. What I wanna do is I want you to know that not only am I here to help, but I have a track history of doing so. And I'm not selling myself as anything that I am not or anything that I haven't already done. My job is to help you build your music career. And if I have to do this to put that trust in, then so be it. So guys, thank you so much for watching. Hopefully this hasn't been as painful for you as it has been for me. I have got very sweaty palms, um, but hopefully we can get back to doing some music marketing and some promotion of music over the next couple of videos. If you can do me a favor, if you can like, subscribe, more importantly, just come and be a part of this music community because I am so proud of what you guys are creating and that I can be a part of it in some small way. So thanks for watching and I'll see you guys soon.